Hey everybody, welcome back to Knitting Butterflies. This is Emily. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, if you are a new listener, Knitting Butterflies is a podcast that I do out of my home um, that is about fiber adventures and photography tips and just life stories. So I hope you all are doing well. Today is Saturday, January 16th, 2016. It is, um, this is episode 44. So this is an audio and a video podcast. I record both audio and video. If you are watching the video, you notice that I have on a headset today. This is to hopefully help improve the sound quality because I've been very not pleased with the sound quality I've been turning out. So I am using the old microphones that I have been using. Um, I have a new microphone here and it was not working with my computer. So while I get that all figured out, We'll still be using the old headset, so I hope it all works okay for you. Um, as always, any feedback about audio quality or video quality is definitely welcome and greatly appreciated. Um, so yeah, the ways to um, listen to the podcast, if you just want to listen, you can always subscribe via iTunes or another um, podcast player. If you just search Knitting Butterflies, then that will pop up. And if you want to watch the podcast, I always post it on YouTube, in the show notes, um, and on the Ravelry board as well. So there are several ways to watch it as well. So that's kind of it for the administrative stuff. Um, let's see, what have we been doing? So it's been a while since I podcasted. We had Christmas. We went and saw the Star Wars movie, which was awesome. I talked about, we were kind of debating um before the last episode whether or not we were going to let our children watch it and we decided to let them watch it after all and I'm really glad that we did um it did have some stuff in it that definitely made it PG-13 and a little bit less than ideal appropriate wise for the kiddos but um but I thought it was fine so um I don't know and I told my kids I said um if the movie had already been out and it was just like on DVD or something I probably would have had them wait to watch it till they were a little bit older because there were some violent things in there and I like to try and keep their innocence as long as I can they're seven and nine but it's a cultural phenomenon and um we just kind of got to the point where we were like we know JJ Abrams work enough to know that there's no um other adult content in it and um I've read a lot of reviews and we finally said we'll take them and pay for their therapy later if we needed to that's kind of become our motto do what feels right pay for therapy later if needed because we're gonna mess them up somehow and I don't think Star Wars is going to be the end of the the reason or the end of the road for them so we really enjoyed the movie we had a good family Christmas my family all lives here in town so it was like an extension of our twice a week dinners that we do with um fancier dinner and presents and um, it snowed terribly. We almost got snowed in at my parents' house, and my mom did say we could stay overnight, but we only live about five minutes away, and so we we went ahead and drove home very carefully. So that was our holiday. Um, what other things? The kids are back at school now. I actually just got a job recently. Um, I was really struggling with being lonely, um, and I've been a stay-at-home mom for nine years now with you know, doing things like the photography business, which I'll still be doing. Um, I've done a couple jobs here and there, but um, mostly end up working for myself or working jobs that require a lot of work from home. And I was tired of doing that. And I said, I want to go somewhere um, and work a shift where I, somebody tells me what to do and I go to work and I do it. And then I go home to my family. So I'm really excited about it. Um, it's in a field that I'm really passionate about. It's I, th I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good for my family and good for me to get out and, and we'll go from there. But um, the podcast will still be going. The blog will still be going. I'll still be doing photography, all that good stuff. So um, that did change around one of the events. But other than that, everything is still the same. So I'll keep you updated on that. But I have been doing a lot of knitting. Um, I have been doing some gift knitting, so I can't show one of the things that I knit today. I'm going to record another little piece about it, um, after I'm all done and then I'll save it for a later episode. Cause I still really want to show it to you guys cause I'm really excited about it, but I can't put it on the podcast today, but I have been knitting quite a bit. I might as well start with what I am. I'm going to start with what I'm working on right now. Cause I have everything all around me. Um, so 
I went through my stash. Okay, so that was, first of all, for Christmas. Shiny. Um, for Christmas, my husband asked, what would I like for Christmas? And um, I already have, like, he was like, you know, what do you want your big present to be? What do you want your big present to be? And I couldn't think of anything. And then I finally said, I think I want my craft closet to be organized and have shelves built in it. And I had bought shelves for it already, but it didn't come with any of the hardware to hang it. And so um, the day after Christmas, he and I went to Home Depot and we picked out all the stuff that I wanted for the closet and came home and he built my closet for me, which was awesome and super helpful. It's nice and full now. And um, I'm even looking at it right now. I'm in my craft room um, and I I have a place to store all my backdrops and I have a place to store all my fabric and um, even my fleece lives in there and I I was able to find a place for so many things that have just been kind of floating around the craft room like my like my dress form didn't have a place and it was just kind of getting bounced around and so that has a home and then I also went to Walmart and bought another shelf to go next to our computer desk so I can put all of my books and we have a stereoscope that we have from his parents and um, that kind of thing so it it's worked out really, really well. It looks, it's starting to come together in here, which makes me very happy. But in the process of that, I realized as I was reorganizing the yarn again, how much sock yarn I have. Um, my stash is not as big as a lot of people's, but it still is, it's a good size stash to the point where my husband looks at me and he goes, you have a lot of yarn. <laughs> and a lot of the sock yarn that I had bought, I bought at things like Stitches or from Friends or a sock blank or things like that. I have a sock blank from Rhineback that Boston Jen sent me and um, I just had all this sock yarn that I love and yet you know how it is when you when you go to a yarn store or whatever, you buy sock yarn and then you only want to cast on that sock yarn and then if you have bought sock yarn before then, then it kind of falls to the wayside and you don't end up using it and I didn't want that to happen. So um, I decided to do the brown bag challenge. I picked out 12, sein, 12 skeins of sock yarn from my stash that I just love. That um, They're all variegated or self-striping or patterned in some way. I didn't choose any solid sock yarn for this particular challenge because I want all of them to be um, the socks that I work on when I'm at my parents' house or in the car or sometimes at the movie theater or at church easy patterns. I don't have plans for anything complicated for any of them. Most of them will end up vanilla or zigzagular socks or Hermione's everyday socks. So those are kind of my three go-to patterns and I have several pairs of each. I know exactly how long I need to knit them and what the repeats look like and I have everything memorized. I don't need to bring a pattern with me and that's kind of my goal. So I picked 12 and I have a goal of doing one a month. So the first one, um, like I said, it's the 16th, so I already have the first sock of two done. But the first pair um, was not a brown bag. I had this specifically picked out because I've been wanting to cast on, cast on these socks for ages. And, um, well, since the yarn's been done. Um, and between all the gift knitting that I did, because I did a lot of gift knitting this year, between all the gift knitting and... Um, that kind of stuff, December just didn't happen. And so um, I knew I wanted to cast on these socks right away. Um, these are socks that are knit out of hand spun that I spun recently, which was um, some Sun Valley fibers, Superwash BFL, and nylon. I bought this fiber at Stitches, and the colorway is called Boundary Waters. And for audio listeners, um, the colors are charcoal gray, olive green, um, kind of a goldenrod color, a little bit of white, some sky blue, and a little bit of turquoise. And when I spin, my favorite way to spin is to just take the braid and just spin really long color repeats. I don't split the braid or anything like that. Um, I just I just spin it straight right from the braid and then I knew when I bought this fiber that I wanted it to be sock yarn so I knew that I wanted it to be a three ply so I did a chain ply um, to keep all of the color progression intact and it made for these really long color um, it's like a gradient it kind of melts into each other like a gradient but it's it's not quite a gradient um, and there's a couple repeats of the color progression 
Um, but the first sock is completely done and this is just a vanilla sock. I do a tubular cast on. I, I knit cuff down. Um, I did 15 rows of the ribbing, maybe 18. I'd have to count it again. And then a cuff heel flap and gusset and then down to a kitchener toe. And I wear size nine women's. I did not do any color management when I knit this particular sock, which I kind of wish that I did because the color progression is nice and smooth down the cuff of the sock. And then I did the heel flap and gusset and then there's a great big line in between where um, the cuff and then the gusset starts between turquoise and charcoal. And that kind of bugs me a little bit, but not enough to make me want to rip it out and fix it. Um, and I saw it as soon as it started and I guess I just didn't care enough because I really wanted it, it, I wanted it to just be straight up. This is what it's like. I also wasn't 100% sure that I would have enough yarn to do a full size sock because um, so many people have told me that with hand spun, you always want to try and do two braids of fiber instead of one so that you have enough yarn for, um, for the socks. So what I did was I spun the yarn and then I plied it into two 50 gram um, skeins and then I just I just balled them up individually. So I knew that I had 50 grams and I knew that I had 426 yards of fiber, but sometimes hand spun can be a little bit iffy with how far your yardage goes. As it turns out, I had plenty of yardage left over. In fact, I can show you that. I have a little ball of the first the first skein left over. Um, that's about, I would say at least 15 grams left over. Um, if I had, if I did it again, which I won't do on this pair of socks because I want them to at least match with how I manage the color and stuff. If I did it again, I would have used the other end of the, of the cake to knit the heel flap and then I would have gone back down to the gusset, but I didn't do it that way. Oh, well, not a big deal. So the first sock is completely done. Um, I knit this on US size zeros. I really love the texture of the hand spun, but I'm also really proud of myself because I feel like it's very even, um, especially for how new of a spinner I am. I've only been spinning since Christmas of 2014. So I was really pleased with myself and how evenly I spun this. And then I was also listening to um, Vicki on the Heartland Knits podcast, and she mentioned one time that um, a while ago that um, – it doesn't matter quite as strongly how tightly your yarn is spun or plied if you're knitting it at a tight enough gauge. So I knit these on size zeros, which is my new favorite um, size to knit socks on. I really like the dense fabric and the hard wearing fabric that it makes. So that is that first sock. And then the second sock is on its way. I have the cuff, the ribbing done, and then I have some of the cuff done. So I have plenty of time though to get this done before the end of the month. Vanilla socks go very quickly. And I'm knitting these on, like I said, USI Zeros, Haya Haya Sharps. I wanna try some Addies though on my next pair of socks in a size zero because I like the Haya Hayas, but they're very sharp and I keep stabbing myself. So that is that pair of socks. What else am I working on? The only other thing that I am currently knitting is, I believe that's it that I'm currently knitting. So I got this new bag from Brenda Castiel, who is Good Stuff Yarn. I'm gonna put it in the show notes and on the um, the video. So I'm, I apologize for not knowing that ahead of time, but, um, but I got this bag, it's a Star Wars bag. It has Ray on it and I originally bought it for my son and then I needed a project bag so I swiped it myself. Whoops, so. Oh, well, I have this fabric and I'm going to make a couple more. So the other thing my husband asked, he wanted to give me something that I could unwrap. So I said, go to the Loopy U, which is very, it's, it's nice and close for him. And I said, go to the Loopy U. And when you walk in the door, there's a basket that says paint box palettes, which are little, um, little packages of nine different colors in their fingering weight from the Loopy Solid series. And I said, go to the paint box palettes and pick up winter which is what I really wanted which the paint box palettes like I said it's nine 15 gram balls of their fingering weight loopy solid series that um, Sherry and her elves have put together to look nice and coordinated together and it's an inexpensive way to make um, 
very multicolored projects without having to spend a lot of money in it. So I really like that. They have a cowl there that I really liked um, that you get the pattern when you buy the paint box palettes, but I wanted something a little bit different. So I am doing something very similar to that cowl and a little bit different and I'll show you. So this is a mix of the paint box palette cowl and the foolproof cowl, which a lot of people have been knitting the pool, the foolproof cowl, um, which is where you start with a triangle and then you knit one side and you knit the other and then you knit the other triangle on the other side. And so that's essentially what I'm doing. And then I'm using a similar color progression that is in the paint box palette cowl. So winter is a mix of grays and browns and dark grays and blues and purples and you get at least one light and dark of each of the the color tones so I started in the middle with a light gray and then I switched over to browns and I um, I'm knitting this on the bias so it makes a nice sorry drapey fabric and I have light brown and dark brown together and then it progressed into light and dark blue I'm gonna draw my stitches and then I ended up with purple on the other side and then I went back and did the other side and I have the light gray progressing into medium and dark gray and then into light and dark purple on the other side so where I am right now is I need to knit a little bit more of the purple um, light and dark on one side I am completely done on the other side so as soon as I get the purples done on the first side then I can knit the triangle in the light purple and that will actually finish it up I started this about four days ago um, so you get 450 yards in in a paint box palette kit and um, I started this about four days ago and I was working on it and I was like I don't know if this is my favorite it's it's okay I like it but I might not keep it I might give it away and then as I was working on it um, I was able to get really creative with the striping progression because both patterns give you like guidelines for what you can do for the striping progression or you can kind of make it up so I did mine based on weight I tried to do one gram two gram three four and five because that would equal 15 grams um, it didn't quite work out that nicely because it's really hard to measure exactly how much yarn is in one gram of fingering weight so it kind of it kind of varied a little bit but it worked out really pretty and I love the way that the stripes work I did a mix of thin stripes and thick stripes and then I also varied how those stripes progressed with within each color block so I like it because it's it's color blocked like the grays are together the browns the blues and the purples but you still get a really nice stripey effect and I think it's gonna look really good um, with my wardrobe because I wear the blues and the grays and the purples a lot like they're in a lot of my wardrobe so this is going to match a lot of my wardrobe and I think I can wrap it around my neck three times when I wear it so it's nice and it's tall enough it's not too tall um, and I think it's gonna be super warm and cozy and I would love to write it down and knit another one I don't know that it's um, different enough from the cowl pattern from the loopy you or from the foolproof cowl that I would feel comfortable actually publishing a pattern for it so let me know what you think as far as um, how different something needs to be because I really don't want to step on toes um, from pattern and I don't want to take things from other patterns and then publish it like I'm not okay with that so I don't know what the guidelines are but I'm I'll write it down at least for myself and I'd like to knit another one and give it as a gift and then we'll go from there I don't know we'll have to see so those are the products that are the projects that I'm currently working on I feel like there's at least one more but I don't think there is um, I've finished a lot of stuff recently though so um, I finished I showed you the Star Wars hats that I knit for my best friend's kids um, and that I wanted to knit the one with the horses on it and I still have it because we haven't seen them since before Christmas um, but I wanted to show you the hat that I finished for him so um, it has his name on the back so I'll not show you the back but this is a stranded knitting hat that I knit out of Cascade 220 Superwash or sorry not 220 Superwash it's Cascade Superwash Sport 
Um, so it's a little bit finer than their worsted weight. And it's a lot softer than the Cascade 220 Superwash. Just so you know, I could totally see making sweaters for my kids out of this and them loving it. Um, I used a green, like a pea green and a, um, a nice happy blue and a bright red. And I knit horseshoes on the bottom and I knit little stars and then a chevron pattern. And then I used a horse chart from a lopi pattern called Hesta Pesa. Um, which is a sweater pattern with horses on it. And I used that chart to chart out horses on the top. So the other charts I made myself, I wrote his name um, in the row with the blue stars. And um, I was pretty proud of myself for that. It does need to be blocked still though, because I can especially see right now that um, my stitches don't look terribly even or at least smooth. So once I block it, it'll be fine. But I finished that hat for him and I think he's really going to love it. So those are sitting in that bag. Oh, this, by the way, is my sock knitter profile bag. I don't use this as a project bag, but I do use it as a shopping and storage bag. This is from One Twisted Tree, and you write down your name and then how you knit your socks. So I knit cuff down, magic loop, one at a time, heel flap and gusset, and most of the time I like to knit the zigzagular pattern. Mine is the bright yellow one, um, so you can find that bag at onetwistedtree.com. Um, other projects that I have finished. So I have been, before the new year started, I wanted to wrap up some of my sock projects and I'll show you these. I'm putting them on sock blockers, so it'll take me just a minute. These socks are knit out of one twisted tree, um, the urban hunters arrow colorway. And I started the first sock back in September after the pigskin party started for Boston Jen. Um, and then the other sock I just didn't finish because I was working on other projects. So once those, all that gift knitting was done, I went ahead and um, started the second sock. So Urban Hunter's Arrow is a really lovely variegated mix of um, teal and steel blue and a little bit of gray. Um, it's marketed as a good masculine color and my husband actually really likes it as well. So um, I know Danny's working on re-releasing this colorway in her shop and I think I might have to pick up a skein so I can knit my husband a pair too. Um, these are 60, 60 stitches size US 1s. This was before I was knitting on zeros. Um, cuff down again the zigzagular pattern by Susie White. Um, tubular cast on. And what's funny about these socks is I knit the first one in September and then I knit the second one in December. And I did not knit as many stitches on the heel flap of the second one. So that made the size of the socks different. But um, I also changed how I tension my yarn in between knitting the two. And there's a full inch difference between these socks. This is the same number of repeats of the zigzagular pattern and the same number of stitches on the cuff. And I double checked that. So I technically did just as many stitches except for the heel flap. But my gauge changed so dramatically that between that and the shorter heel flap, there's an entire inch difference in the height of the socks. I don't really care. It doesn't bother me. Um, I also noticed that the first sock before I was cinching is the, the fabric is a little bit looser than the second sock is. Um, quite a bit looser actually. And I noticed that when I put them on, but it, it's not enough to bother me. I don't have sensitive feet at all. I really don't care. Um, so I'm totally fine with it. It's just kind of one of those funny things that happen and something that I'll be watching out for in the future. But I love the socks and I'm glad that now um, that first sock has its mate. So it was sitting in my drawer very lonely and looking for its mate. So... I finished another pair of socks in the month of December. I have been working on these and you haven't seen a whole lot of these on Instagram just because I mostly work on these or I did work on these when I was in hard to photograph places. So like the movie theater or in the car. Um, and then I also worked on them when I was at my parents' house when I could not um, knit their boot, their beer koozies or their hats in front of them. So that was what I, that was when I worked on these. These are some vanilla socks that I knit out of some Regia Arnie and Carlos in the garden colorway, which is a mix of bright cherry red, um, teal, and light and dark grays. And the Arnie and Carlos yarn is made to look like, fo it's faux fair isle. So it looks kind of like you do fair isle 
knitting and all you have to do is just knit a vanilla sock so I really love that about the Arnie and Carlos yarns I picked these up in Traverse City Michigan um, at I can't even remember the name of the shop but there's one of the shops in Traverse City that carries the Arnie and Carlos so that was fun to find that little shop it's a really adorable shop and um, with very very nice knitters who are wonderful to talk to I spent a while chatting with people in there so again same thing um, US one's cuff down 60 60 stitches around heel flap and gusset and a kitchener toe so I love these socks both of these now live in my sock drawer I keep picking at them because I have worn these since I finished them and um, they get dog hair and stuff in them sometimes too but I love those socks so that is it for those finished objects for the stuff that I can show you for right now as far as knitting um, as far as spinning goes I have some fiber from into the world some of their Polworth fiber and this colorway is called tickled pink this was sent to me by a lovely listener and um, I love this fiber I this is my third braid of into the world that I have spun and it's a mix of there's some peaches and pinks and purples and grays and gray blue and it's a lot like the Colorado sunsets that we have so I really love it I have spun the first two bobbins completely I split the braid into three um, I split it apart into three parts so that the color progressions wouldn't be quite so long um, and my plan is to do a three ply so I have the first two bobbins of that completely done and um, they're looking lovely and I have bobbin number three on the wheel right now I should be able to finish it in the next week or so depending on how much spinning time I get done um, but that will probably be it's not super washed so I don't want it to be socks sorry my strap keeps falling down inside of um, my undershirt strap but um, so that won't be socks I think it's going to be either a shawl or I am setting aside a bunch of yarn to eventually be a, um, a loose ends sweater I think is what it's called where you take six different braids um, and spin them similar or the same way and then you knit them all together into a sweater so my hope is to have kind of a barber pulled effect I don't want to have the chain ply actual stripes on this particular yarn I want it to be the barber pulled mixed um, effect for that so we will see what happens from there. So that is it for all of my knitting for right now. We're doing pretty good on time. For events, we have several events coming up. One of them I need to let you know um, that I will not be able to attend that I was planning on attending. That is the Knit Nosh event. Um, this is happening January 23rd from 1230 to 330 in Longmont, Colorado at the Samplers Bistro. Um, I was originally planning on attending and that was before I got a job um, and I still don't know my schedule yet and um, and I I had put off buying a ticket and put it off and, and I didn't know why I felt like I needed to put it off because I was planning on going and then um, and then I got a job and so I actually need to this job requires me to be available on the weekends as well so I'm going to have to not um, be at that event and I'm really 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 sorry I feel so bad I know some of you bought tickets hoping that you'd be able to um, to have all of us hang out together and um, I feel terrible but I am in the area so um, there are lots of other events that maybe we can meet each other up at but I and I also um, did send Becky some podcast buttons that she can put into your goodie bag so um, it sounds like it's going to be a fun event. It's $50 to attend and that includes a four course meal, wine, a goodie bag, and samples from four different yarn companies including Bichu Basin, Nerd Shop, um, Scandalous, and MJ Yarns. And so you'll be able to sample all of those different yarns and then I know they've included stuff for your goodie bags and things like that too. So it should be a really fun event if you get to go. The next event that I will be attending though because nothing is stopping me from going to this one is stitches west which is february 7 or 18 through 21st in santa clara california at the santa clara convention center um, i will be there i'm super excited about it i'll be there for all the days that they're open um and um i think it's gonna be really fun there is a podcaster meetup on saturday and i will be in attendance at that as well you can find more information about all of that stuff at stitches west 
online or there is a Ravelry group for Stitches West as well. So I hope to meet you there. Um, that's a part of the country I have not had a chance to visit since I became a knitter and a podcaster. So I'm really hoping to meet up with a lot of you that I haven't met before. Um, and I think that'll be a whole lot of fun. So I will see you at that one. Interweave Yarn Fest is coming up um, April 2nd and 3rd is Saturday, Sunday. Um, and that is at the Embassy Suites Hotel in Loveland, Colorado. Um, that is an, another really fun event. Um, at this point, what we are planning for a meetup is to go to the Qdoba across the street for dinner after the market closes. That is kind of where we're at right now. Um, I'm going to open a thread on the Ravelry group under Knitting Butterflies. If you are going to be attending Yarn Fest and you would like to meet up, please let me know that you're going to um, be in the area so I can make sure and contact you. And I'll put all the actual formal information for time and things like that um, when the time gets closer for that event. So Zombie Knit Apocalypse is coming up in June. Rhineback is coming up in October. I think it's going to be a really good year for fiber events. So I hope to see you at some of these events. I have a book review to share with you today. Um, today we are going to be talking about the book Free Spirit Knits, which is designed by Anne Podlasak and put out by Interweave Press. This was sent to me by Interweave to review. And we also have a giveaway of the same book for you as well. Um, this book is 20 Knitted Garments and Accessories Inspired by the Southwest. So there are 20 different patterns. It retails for US $25.99, Canadian $28.99. And um, the best way to order it is through the Interweave website. You can order on Amazon or you can also check your local yarn shop as well. So I have links to the Interweave website to be able to purchase this book if you decide you like it. The review that I want to share with you guys is how much I love this book. I actually contacted Anne and asked her if I could do a review because Anne and I... Um, I would can we met at yarn fest last year and have been in contact ever since and so whenever she would post pictures on facebook of her patterns from this book i was just blown away by them every single time um and she has an amazing sense of style i love how the photographs in this pic in this book are styled i think that um, it sells a really interesting and beautiful lifestyle of kind of a bohemian, Native American kind of mix of wild and free that I would love to be able to pull off. There's no way I could, but it's really beautiful all the same, and I could totally see wearing the actual garments that she knits. So um, I would love to see, I'm curious to see at Stitches if she has some of these pieces and outfits um, at the fashion show. We'll have to see because I think... Um, I think it's definitely fashion show worthy. There's, um, you know, garlands in, in the model's hair and feathers and there's, you know, beautiful maxi skirts and necklaces and headbands and all these things. And it's so gorgeous. Um, she does a really beautiful job with every piece that's in this book. She talks about the inspiration for the piece and how it relates to, you know, to Mexico, um, where she lives but I also feel like she does such a good job in executing it in a way that it's very real and authentic and I feel like you could really connect with that inspiration as you knit each piece and yet still have them be pieces that you can actually wear so um, I'll go through a few of the pieces in the book the photography is just stunning I'm not sure if they did the photography in New Mexico um, there are some places, Interweave is located um, in Colorado, and so there are some places I can think of that are nearby that look like this, but it very well could be in New Mexico as well, so I don't know. We'll have to see, but the photography is just stunning. They went to um, a place with beautiful rock formations and plant life and everything, and it's well lit. The pieces are very easy to see. Um, the color, her color choices are stunning. Um, it's a palette of, you see a lot of terracotta and turquoises and browns and some purple. And it's, um, there's a lot of natural colors, like this really beautiful green. This is the sweater on the cover. It's called the Aspen's, Aspen's Sweater, which I felt like just knocked it out of the park. Um, like I said, it's on the cover and then it's the very first pattern in the book, which I felt like was a really good way to start 
the actual um, the book. It is um, a cardigan that has a cable panel that goes down both fronts of the cardigan, down the sides of the sleeves, and then a big version of it goes down the back. And um, I don't know how much I can show you, but it goes down the back. And I don't want to show you too much, but it's just an amazing piece. Um, but the palette that she uses is one that I'm very familiar with because I've seen it in a lot of Southwest Southwestern art. But it's executed in a way that is very modern and beautiful and um, easy to wear with the color palettes that are available to us today, um, even just in, in regular fashion and things like that. So I felt like um, she did a good job not only designing with the overall design elements in mind, but I could see knitting it exactly in the yarns and the colors that she shows and wearing it in my everyday wardrobe. The Grand Canyon coat I think is a stunning piece. It's a really nice long coat um, knit out of, what is the yarn she shows? Dream and Color Classy, which is a really great yarn. Um, and it goes down really far, um, mostly stockinette with, it's it's just the littlest details that she puts in this book that make it really classy. There's um, an I-cord edge that is in a contrasting purple and it looks just stunning. Um, and then just everything down to like, I can see she really thought through her bind offs and things like that to make everything just look very couture and very, um, what's couture I guess is the word that I'm looking for um the there's some really cool socks in here called petroglyph socks that you can do symbols and things I'm just I'm flipping through the three sisters shawl I think is my either favorite or second favorite next to the aspen sweater um this shawl is knit in such a way that it will actually rest on your shoulders but it still has the nice big triangle kind of shape to it um with amazing light lace detail that I think would just keep you going for a long time and then an applied edge um, and the model I wish I could wear clothes like this model she's wearing this beautiful white flowy dress and a gold headband and you know necklaces with like feathers and stuff and, oh my gosh there's no way I could pull that off and her boots are awesome but um but I feel like you would feel like you could pull it off if you were to knit something like this um my favorite Oh, I love the snowball hoodie. The snowball hoodie needs to come live in my closet. It's a gray hoodie with this really cool cable detail down the back and it zips up and it's really, really cool. So like I said, a lot of these pieces would definitely fit in your everyday wardrobe. My favorite description of the pieces is the Salt River um, sweater, which I'm pulling it up. It's a men's sweater. Um, there's some really great cowls and wraps and stuff, but I want to find the salt. Oh, that's right. The churro sheep. Um, the Salt River sweater. Here it is. It's one of the last patterns in the book. It's a men's sweater and I like it. I think it's a very nice sweater. It has some cabling. Well, it has lots of cabling actually. It's an all over ca cabled worsted weight sweater. So it's going to be very warm. Um, but her her sample is knit in Harrisville Highland, which I think is really cool. Um, but it she talks about how um, Central Arizona Salt River has one of the few remaining wild horse herds in the United States. This group of animals forages along the banks of the river, and while the precise location of the herd remains a closely kept secret to prevent them from being disturbed, members of the herd can often be seen grazing along the edges of the Mesa River by kayakers. That paints a visual picture in my mind that I feel like I can see so clearly, and it sounds magical and amazing. And then after reading that, I looked at the sweater again and I could see that she's designed, there's a cable down the front or a cable pattern down the front to be the water. And then she has like the rocky area and this, the shore. And then she has the plants and stuff to be like the, um, the plant life next to the river. And to me that just, it paints such a beautiful picture and it makes the sweater feel like so much more than just a cabled sweater. Like she really thought through her um her descriptions and her um her execution my other like one of my favorite patterns in here is the churro sheep cowl look how cute this cowl is this cowl is a nice big long cowl with sheep that kind of look like 
the sheet from that Kate Davies pattern, but not really. Um, it is knit with Jameson and Smith, which I think is really cool. No, Elemental Effects Natural Shetland Fingering. Okay, so not Jameson. There's something else knit with Jameson in here, but that's what I thought it was. But um, it just has these sheep, and it's executed so cute, and I could totally see wearing it, and I really want the hat that the model is wearing. Like, this is what I'm talking about. This book is not just like... It's not just knitting patterns to me. It's definitely like, I don't want just the cowl. I want her, her top and I want her bracelets and I want her hat and I want this whole look. Like everything about it I just think is really cool. Um, I just love the way that she put all of this together. I feel like the lifestyle that is being sold in here is really beautiful and something that I could definitely, maybe when I'm a grown up someday, um, see myself you know, I would, enjoying, that's what I could see, I could see myself enjoying it. Um, I would say that as far as difficulty level, so her, her diagrams are really good. She does go over, there's a little bit of techniques in the back of the book about, um, placing beads, because there's a really cool beaded, oh, there's a really cool beaded shawl in here. Um, she does a couple things, like, um, she goes over different cast-ons, like the long tail and the, the, um, backwards loop cast-on and stuff. Um, she goes over increases, decreases, the sewn bind off. Um, I feel like as long as you know how to knit and purl, you can do anything in this book because she gives you directions and diagrams on how to do all the techniques that she talks about in this book. So I think that's really cool. Um, I would say this book is good for a, a knitter who enjoys a challenge um, or or. I should say, is not intimidated by something like cables or color work or lace because there there isn't any project in here that's just straight up simple stockinette. Like every piece in here has some element of taking your knitting to the next level. I would really love to knit a lot of these patterns because that is where I am in my knitting life. I like to knit stockinette, but I really um, cherish those projects that push me a little bit harder. And I think that that's what every single piece in here does in a really positive way. I don't think there's anything in here that's so ridiculously hard that it's not inaccessible to somebody who is willing to learn. Um, but you might need to learn a technique here or there to really enjoy some of the patterns in here. So like I said, this is Free Spirit Knits by Anne Podlesack put out by Interweave Press and I have links to everything about it in the show notes and you should check it out for yourself. We are also going to do a giveaway of this book as well. So if you would like to enter the giveaway, I am opening a thread on Ravelry today. And what I want you to do is um, pretty much the standard um, click on the link that is in the Ravelry board. Look at all the patterns. Tell me which of the patterns is your favorite. Um, and you will be entered to win a copy of this book. And you will be entered to win this copy, the paper copy, um, that will be mailed out by me. So go to the Ravelry board pick out your favorite pattern, let me know what it is, and that's how you get entered. So that is it for our book review today. So the last segment of the Knitting Butterflies podcast is always about photography um, because I am a photographer. I would call myself an amateur professional photographer. Um, I'm not a really awesome, amazing photographer, but I do, I do enjoy my job. And um, so I wanted to talk today about storing your photos on your computer because if you are watching the video you can see behind me there is a computer that's taken apart all over my workspace in my craft room we had a bit of an incident happen at my house recently so I have a laptop that I just purchased recently that I do things like sales and um, I don't really do editing on it because it doesn't have the a fast enough hard drive um, and RAM to be able to handle what I need for editing. Um, but I do things like sales, email communications, like all of the business stuff on this laptop. And then we have another computer out in the living room in our basement that is for editing. And it's where I store all my photos and it's where I do all my editing. And my kids also occasionally play on this computer. So maybe that was my first mistake. But for the most part, it hasn't been a problem. They play games like um, PBS Kids or Friv or things like that. So that computer had a, all the elements were plugged into a surge protector, which was then plugged into the wall, which is what everybody does. And it was in a place that my kids could sit at the computer chair and they would kick 
the surge protector cord a lot. Um, I don't know what made them start that because it had been down there for a year and a half before they started doing that. And they started doing it in November and between November and Christmas, they accidentally unplugged that computer like 10 times. Computers are not made to lose power randomly and bad things can happen when that happens. They're, they're kind of made to handle it every now and then, but 10 times in like two months is an awful lot. And at some point, the kids unplugged it by accident and it would not turn back on. And I about lost it. Um, I was really glad I hadn't been shooting because I wouldn't have been able to edit any of my photos because my computer wasn't turned on. Um, we got a replacement computer and, um, my husband went through, well, the first thing he did was he went through this computer and took everything apart and tried to figure out, okay, what piece is failing? Um, the RAM wasn't failing, the hard drive wasn't failing, um, but the motherboard to the computer and the CPU, I think they're different things. I don't know. I'm not that smart of a person, but, um, but the CPU was fried, the motherboard was fried, the power supply was fried, um, and one of my external hard drives was fried as well. So I have two four terabyte external hard drives that were always plugged into my computer that I, um, I would upload all of the images that I would edit onto one of those. And then every night before we went to bed, those two would talk to each other and back each other up. So all of the information was always on both of them every single day. Um, and one of those got fried as well, which is what makes us think that it was something from the surge protector that fried everything because those were not plugged in power wise to the computer. Long story. Sorry. So in other words, it fried our whole computer. Um, and we waited for the new one to come in. Thank goodness the hard drive, it's like all of the information, the hard drive was still okay. And one of my external hard drives was still okay. So I didn't lose any of the photos. I didn't lose any of my family photos. Um, we thought we did for a little bit and we didn't, thank goodness. Um, but I didn't lose any of the, the photos that I had for clients, which was really good. Got the new computer all set up and everything. And it made me realize how close we came to really losing a lot of valuable data. I do follow the rules for storing photos um, when it comes to my client stuff. I don't follow it for my family photos because I just, I just don't. Um, and I realized how important that really is. So I thought I would talk to you guys about how to store your photos in a way that you don't have to worry about your kids ruining your computer and then losing all of your photos. Um, this is why I talked about in a couple episodes ago how important it is to print your photos because I truly believe that technology is a ticking time bomb and it is waiting to just get fried. Um, and, and I wasn't following my own advice either. And so I also think though that it's important to store them digitally because um, paper photos can have something so easily happen to them. Something as simple as juice gets spilled on it and it will ruin them. Or, um, or like if your house burns down, God forbid something like that happens, but it does happen. Um, that there are guidelines in place of storing things like your photos and your documents and stuff on your computer that can help make the losses not that big of a deal. Um, it turned out to be not that big of a deal for us. It, it just took several hours of work to catch up and resync everything and reinstall Lightroom and reinstall Photoshop and reinstall all my programs and all my presets and everything. It's still, we're still recovering from it even a couple weeks later. So the guidelines for storing your photos digitally are three, two, one, three, is to have three different um, three different places that you're storing. We're, we're talking about photos here, but it's pretty much anything. So three different places to store your photos. So in this case, I did follow that rule because we had our internal hard drive on our computer and two external hard drives for all of my client stuff. We were not following that rule for all of our family photos, which was bad. So I'm following that rule now. So um, three different places, two different formats, so again, we were following the rule with the internal hard drive on the computer and the external hard drive. Um, if I was only using the external hard drives, that wouldn't be good because 
um, if a power surge fried one, it most likely will fry the other one. And we really lucked out that it didn't fry the other one. Um, so two different formats. And then one is one offsite location. Um, I found out we actually had two offsite locations after talking to my husband the other day. Basically, you want to protect yourself in a way that if your house burns down or if somebody breaks in and steals, like if they came in and they saw external hard drives, that's easy money. They can stick it in their bag and take off. Um, so it's important to have at least one off-site location that you're storing your photos. We did this two ways. One is um, I wasn't doing this with my raw files, which is the big non-compressed formats from my um, camera. Those were all being stored on site. But when I would finish a session, I uploaded onto a gallery through a website called Zenfolio, which is for professional photographers. And um, and for that, I don't have a limit on the number of photos that I can store on there, and I don't have a limit on the number of time they can stay on. So all of my clients' photos, the finished photos, the edited photos are all on Zenfolio. So even if something did happen to those external hard drives because I keep on top of my stuff and edit all of my sessions regularly and get them uploaded onto Zenfolio as soon as possible, my clients can still get their photos even if they call me two years from now and say, do you have my photos? Can I burn a disc or anything? And I can always say yes. So that was how I was taking care of that. Um, it's kind of like cloud service. You can do, I don't, I don't really know the cloud services that are available to consumers. I know like, um, I know some people who use Flickr or Picasa or things like that. The important, um, some people use SmugMug. The important thing to keep in mind is that you always need to find out how long those services will hold your files for you because sometimes um, galleries will have an expiration date on them um, that is put on by the, the owner of the server. So it just depends on how you want to do it. I know there are companies that sell cloud services um, for purposes like this. So it's definitely worth looking into. My husband was doing it in a way too where he had an external hard drive that he would back up our whole computer onto that external hard drive and then he would take it to work with him and he would swap it out with another external hard drive. He'd bring that one home and then like a month later back everything up and then he'd just switch back and forth every month. And I didn't know he was doing this so it was nice for us to have that kind of a talk. Um, some people will do things like back it up to a flash drive and mail it to a relative who lives out of state. I don't go that far. Um, I kind of figure this is the best that I can possibly do. And then I try really hard to make sure that I order prints as well. Because if something like, if something catastrophic happened, like in the show Revolution and all of my photos are only stored online or on computers, and we don't have access to electricity, I can't look at those photos anymore. So um, I try to think of the worst possible scenarios and make sure that I'm covered for that so that when my kids unplug my computer, I still have lots of backup and lots of ways to access my, my photos and storage. So again, those rules are three, two, one, three different places, two different formats, at least one offsite location. If you stick to the bare minimum of that, you should be totally fine. And then there are ways to add even more to that if you would like. So, um, the way that I organize my photos, um, this is a system that we've put in place actually since we got married and I have found it to work very well for our family. Every time I upload any photos onto my computer, I always put it in a folder. Um, I always put it in the public picture so that I can access it no matter who is um, on the computer if my husband is or if I am we don't I don't put it in like my pictures and his pictures because that can make it confusing depending on who's trying to um, access those folders so I always put it in a public folder and then I have the public folder sorted by year and then after that every single time I put photos on my computer I put that in a separate folder in that year that is dated with the year dash month dash date when I upload those photos. And I do this for two reasons. One, um, it makes it seem like it's really hard to find your photos if you're trying to look through all your photos at once, but it's not. If you use a search box um, dot JPG, then it shows you all of the photos in that whole group. So if I click on 2015 and then I search dot JPG, I will see everything, but I'm going to see it in order as well. I don't ever rename photos, um, at least not family photos. I only rename finished client photos and that's a whole different thing, which I won't get into, but, um, 
but I put it in by date so that I know when those photos were taken. I do Project Life by Becky Higgins and the dates are really important on that. And this makes it really easy to see at a glance without having to look at a list or the properties of a photo when that photo was taken. Um, and then I do it in the number format that I do so that everything ends up in exact order. So if I were to upload photos today, I would put it in a folder that would say 2016-01 for January-16. I don't do 01-16-2015 because I sometimes the computer doesn't always recognize that zero depending on what program you're using and things like that and it can make things get out of order and I'm very very meticulous of seeing things in the exact order that were uploaded so um, that's how I do it for my family I personally like I said I don't rename files to be like um, Davy and Jen's wedding or something like that I don't do that um, because it can make it hard to find files and I know that I store them in the same folder every single time um, then the, the the nice part is that even though organizing your photos on your computer can seem really overwhelming, it doesn't take terribly long, especially if you use that search box that I talked about. Let's say that you know you have all of your photos on your C drive on your computer. You can go up to that search box and type .jpg and it'll take about 25 minutes to search your whole computer, but it will show you where all of your photos are. You can highlight them all and then you can copy and paste them into a new folder and then you know that it's done. And then once you do that, you can also set up your computer to put photos into that folder every single time you upload. So my computer automatically knows I want all of my folders in the pictures file and then it knows, at least for the year 2015, that it wants it in that folder and then it uploads it into a folder that it makes automatically with the correct dates and I don't have to sort anything it just does it for me so because we've been using that system now for the 11 years that we've been married almost 12 both of us know exactly where to find our photos all the time and it makes it really quick and really efficient so that's how we organize our photos if you have suggestions for storing your photos and organizing your photos I would really 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 love to hear about that because this is the problem that I find a lot of people get overwhelmed by and I also know it's January and a lot of people have resolutions to get organized and I think organizing your photos is a really really great place to start because if you can organize them on your computer then when it comes time for you to make prints and put them in a book or something like that um, it can make it so much more, it can make it so much faster and more efficient. So as always, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know on Ravelry or, um, or through the blog. So that's going to wrap it up for our episode today. As always, you can find me on Ravelry under the name Emily Straw. You can find me on Instagram and Periscope under Butterfly M4. All the show notes and photos of finished objects that I can't, that I have, as well as the embedded video of this podcast will be on knittingbutterfliespodcast.com. And I hope to hear from you soon. Have a good day.